as I am just fresh finished the West Highland Way and I've been a part of one of the West Highland Way Facebook groups for a while and seeing people asking various questions on there. Now I've hiked it myself, I should be able to answer a fair few questions and I will tell you a couple of places that I stayed and it, things that I experienced while I was hiking. But I just thought I'd put together basically a bit of a guide for hiking the West Highland Way. Also general tips and hacks for equipment to take and things to use in different ways because I've hiked half of the Appalachian Trail so I have a few hiking miles under my belt. I thought it might come of use to some people to know some various things or for me to recommend some equipment. I will go through the places that I stopped at on the West Highland Way towards the end of the video because that's quite personal in a way in terms of how many miles I hiked per day and you might uh, do something completely different so I don't want to have that right at the beginning of the video although of course you could skip that anyway but I'll put that towards the end and um, what I will do is try and link as much stuff as possible in the description links to specific equipment that I mention anything else that I that I think is useful I'll try and link to it and yeah I'll, I'll add uh, any details to follow up with in the description section oh I will also pop in some timestamps for when I start talking about different things so that you don't have to watch the entire video and go through bits that might not necessarily be relevant to you. So what I am going to start off with is just a, a little summary about the West Highland Way. It's 96 miles, it starts from the southwest, south southwest of uh, Scotland in Milgai, which is just north of Glasgow and it finishes in Fort William, which is like West uh, Scotland. It's a fantastic trail. If it's one of your first or the first long distance hike that you go on, there's a mixture of terrain, nothing, I mean, it's challenging, but nothing horrendously challenging, but you're, you're, you're gonna ache. There's a mix of ascents and descents. A mixture of you know some technical hiking and then also some very simple walking with big wide expansive vistas and different different kinds of climates and scenery so it's a really brilliant hike to do in general and if it's a first hike it would be a really really good place to start tips for hiking I'm gonna start with Ziplocs. This could be a little bit of a divisive subject because obviously Ziplocs are plastic. It, it doesn't sit well with me in a way to use lots of Ziplocs, but they are also very handy for lots of things. I'm perfectly happy for anyone to just like give me any other alternatives in the comments or things that you've managed to replace Ziplocs with, but being completely honest, they're a godsend and a lifesaver to me when I'm hiking. I'd go for the freezer Ziplocs because they can be, that you know, they're tougher and they can be used in lots of different ways. But for example, Ziplocs are your friend for sectioning food, for packing out trash and, or rubbish. Here is an example of the way I use it blocks to section out my food per day. Breakfast, dinner is the mountain house in here and then I've also got some snacks in there and I will do that for every single day. Oh and an electrolyte sachet and I will do that every single day um, so that all my food is sectioned out and I'm not taking too much along with me. Once that's used for the day then that can become a trash bag for me. I still, I'm just unpacking all my stuff so I've still got all my gross examples of things. So then I can use, you know, that as a trash bag 
Another thing that I use Ziplocs for is, this is way, this is way too big. Make your own first aid, etc. kit. So I've got, you know, my paracetamol, my ibuprofen, my antihistamines, my plasters, bite and sting cream, tampons. I also have a emergency blanket and then gauze and things like that so that's i've made my own first aid kit within a ziplock ladies if it unfortunately is your time of the month whilst you're out and about hiking then again ziplock is great to pack out any tampons or pads that you have or applicators and things like that because remember you you cannot bury it or leave it out there you have to pack it and bring it back with you. So Ziplocs, number one piece of equipment <laughs> for me. Number two, they're divisive again, but one of my best things that I take out hiking with me, Crocs. Now, camp shoes, you're gonna need camp shoes at the end of the day to give your feet a rest, get them out of your shoes that you've been wearing all day because they're like, you know swollen in there and compressed and they just need a they just need to be free so crocs are the best they dry out really quickly your toes are covered you do not want to be having exposed toes around your campsite because all it takes is for you to boot a tent peg and you've broken a toe or split a blister open or taken a toenail off or any of those horrible nasty things so crocs are brilliant mock crocs i actually find better these were from audi and they were like 2.99 because they're actually slightly lighter than uh, branded crocs for some reason probably just like cheaper material but yeah it's less weight to carry what i also do is put a shoelace or a paracord through them and then hang them on the outside of your bag where you strap your bag together so they can just swing around on the outside of your bag and you don't have to waste space putting them inside of your bag. Okay, next piece of equipment, I cannot stress this one enough. You need hiking poles. It's very important that you have hiking poles and I've seen lots of people dismiss them and it's almost a bit of a, oh gosh, you don't need hiking poles. You're not old enough to have hiking poles and I did it without hiking poles and if I can do it then... That's, I think, is a bit of an ego trip and there are lots of things that you can do without things but you wouldn't. <laughs> the benefits of hiking poles are less stress on your joints like your ankles and your knees and your hips. If they're used properly, they can take up to 40% of the weight off of you because you're leaning on two extra things. They help you through technical sections where you can effectively use them as third and fourth legs to lean on and jump down and around and use them to kind of get around things. They help you on climbs, they help you on coming down. They're just, you need them. I have Lecky, Lecky hiking poles. They're adjustable, they move up and down so you can adjust them to your height. Okay, shoes or boots? That is uh, entirely up to you. That is a decision you need to make with how you comfortably feel. Boots are better stability on your ankles. They tend to have thicker soles. You know, when you're walking over rocks and things, you're not feeling them through the bottom. I prefer to have trail runners. I just feel like I can feel the floor a little bit better. So I'm not turning my ankle on things because I can't really quite feel the angle of where things are at with boots. I also feel that when I'm walking and they and trail runners get wet that they dry out more easily. I just feel a bit more agile in them. Uh, when I say trail runners, I do not mean running trainers or anything like that. I mean proper 
hiking trail runners with a very sturdy sole. A lot of them have rock plates in the sole which can stop you know when you're on rocky terrain kind of it's sticking into the bottom of your foot and bruising. Generally half a size up for shoes as well is important. Sometimes it's even a whole size up just I would I would say try them on I mean at the very least try them on you should be wearing them in before you go out you must at least half a size up sometimes a whole size up because as you're hiking throughout the day your feet will swell and when you're going up and down you can jam your toes against the end of your shoes so just be mindful of that sticking with the feet theme as soon as as you feel a hot spot on your foot, stop and assess it. Don't think I'll assess it in half an hour, I'll assess it in an hour and I know it can be so irritating when you're in the zone. It usually seems to come at a time when you've really got a pace on, your legs are feeling strong, you're not feeling achy, but you can just feel that hot spot on your foot. I really would recommend that you stop and have a look at the hot spot because you could actually stop it even turning into the beginnings of a blister, let alone a blister. There is a tape called Luco Tape. It is phenomenal. It's kind of pricey, but it will last for a while because you won't need to take the whole roll out. So if you just like wrap it around itself into a little ball and stick that into your hopefully not as big as this first aid kit, and then you can take bits off of that little wrapped around thing. So the Luco tape is just super sticky. It would stay on there for, for like a week. <laughs> it's insane. So if you feel any hot spots on your foot, stop immediately. Take your shoes off, let your feet breathe and get some preferably Luco tape or plasters or whatever on that section just to stop it even trying to be a blister. The thing that I really recommend is the Gut Hooks app. That is G-U-T-H-O-O-K-S app. It's effectively a trail app and it has lots and lots and lots of different trails on. You purchase each each one separately. And they've just recently, well I say recently, maybe in the last couple of years, got one for the West Highland Way. But I think it costs something like seven or eight pounds. And it's really, really beneficial because you purchase the map and you download it onto your phone. Once you've got it, you can then put your phone into airplane mode as to not drain the battery and it will still locate your exact spot on the trail so you can see yourself in live time on the trail. The app also tells you where campsites are, where water sources are, cabins are, towns are. So it's it's really fabulous. I love Gut Hooks. Can't recommend it enough. That kind of brings me to keeping your phone charged up. You might want to take a paper map as well because some people feel more comfortable that way just in case their phone smashes into smithereens somehow. So keeping your phone charged, I take this power bank. It's an anchor and it's a 20,100 something or other basically that is the equivalent of about four or five phone charges it's got multiple ports so you can fit two yeah two things in at once maybe three actually i really really recommend this bit of a weight penalty but it it's important trim your nails <laughs> is uh, my next tip and that is your fingernails and your toenails to really as short as what is comfortable because if you think about it your nails are pretty much just things that can collect crap and germs and dirt underneath and that is not conducive to keeping healthy on a long distance trail especially when you're not washing that much you don't want any kind of long nails because you're probably going to rip them or snap them anyway and cause yourself some pain. Also if you want to grab things and if there's anything on the trail where you need to like scoot down on your butt or like grab and swing around a tree then it's best that your nails are as short as possible so you can you know feel and reach around and similarly with your toenails you don't want them 
bashing and bashing against the end of your shoe, you're just going to end up entirely losing your toenail from it falling off. So it's best that you just trim them. You obviously don't want to trim them short enough for it to be sore. <laughs> okay, in terms of the West Highland Way, there will be midges. Two days I went and there were no midges to be seen. And I was like, I'm sure I've heard people going on and on and on about these midges. I've never, I've not seen any. And then bam, day three, there were midges absolutely everywhere, like swarms. If you breathed, I was like swallowing them where they were just getting sucked into my mouth <laughs> while I was breathing. So take a head net. Do be aware with some of the head nets that they're actually not, the holes are not small enough so the midges can still get through so it's not a hundred percent protection it just slows them down from getting to you basically and allows you that little bit more time remember that they tend to hang around like damp humid foisty moist water sources and environments if it's windy or particularly cold they tend to be either not around at all or less around. In my opinion, yes, even on this trail, carry a water filter. Now I've seen lots and lots of people in the groups advising each other that you're drinking mountain water and that there's lots of water on the trail because you pass through towns. And while that is true, I don't like to rely on finding a building or a person to fill my water bottle for me. I, I just don't like that. I don't like not knowing. I don't like it being out of my control as to when I can next get water. I always carry a water filter with me because ultimately you can't trust the sources, unless you are drinking from the very beginning where the water actually bubbles up from the ground, you're not drinking from the source. And so anything could have contaminated or got into that source on the way down to where you're drinking it now. So you need to filter the water. It's not scary. I use a soil water filter. You collect it in this. You let the water run into it. You might need to make sure it's inflated a bit so that the water can get in. You screw this on the top, which is the filter, and you literally roll it down and squeeze the water out into a water bottle. And that is because, yeah, I don't like relying on something external to me to where I'm gonna get my water. I wanna be in control of when I get my water. I don't wanna be dehydrated. So I had a really long day and I felt like I couldn't make it to the town that I was aiming for. Then I'm stuck either with the decision to drink potentially dirty water and give myself a water parasite, which is not fun because I have actually had one, or, or I'm dehydrated because I won't drink the water and it's just not worth it. So carry a water filter. Also, I like to filter my water because then I don't have to carry a ton for the whole day because water is extremely heavy. It adds a lot of weight. So I don't wanna be carrying, you know, two or three liters of water for the entire, well, obviously you drink it throughout the day so it gets a bit less and a bit lighter, but I don't want to be carrying that all day waiting for when I get to the next building for someone to fill water up for me, I want to be able to just fill it up and drink it as I go because then I'm not giving myself a weight penalty. In terms of clothes, I take one pair of hiking trousers or I usually use legging, a pair of shorts, one long sleeve shirt, like a Columbia UV ray shirt so that I couldn't get sunburnt through it, one long sleeve top that I would like typically wear to the to the gym so like a longer layer sweat wicking and then very very lightweight sweat wicking gym vest top just to wear underneath those other tops so that they're not taking all of that sweat in. I also have a waterproof jacket which is a mountain equipment waterproof jacket but it is fairly heavy and it was expensive so 
What some people do is carry a poncho. There is a company called Frog Togs, which is more of an American company, but you can get some frog togs online. When you get a poncho, you get a hood and it's a big, huge poncho. And some people throw that over their bag so you can use it as a bag cover at the same time. Much cheaper alternative. I just prefer and love my jacket at the moment. Maybe at some point I'll you know, grab a frog tog poncho and kind of look at the difference. I also take some waterproof trousers and it's kind of an emergency thing for me because when it rains, I tend to just keep my shorts on so that, you know, my skin's just going to dry out and I'm hiking at such a rate that it doesn't bother me too much because I'm warm on the top from wearing my rain jacket. But the waterproof trousers are essentially to be used for me, A, if I need them as windbreakers and I'm, it's really, really cold and I need to put them on. B, um, there are insects everywhere that are just biting through the trousers that I've got and I need that extra thicker protection on my legs. Or C, it is absolutely torrential rain and I cannot risk getting what I have on the bottom drenched beyond drenched <laughs> and i know it won't dry out because say i've looked into the weather report and it's raining for the next three days so i need to preserve you know the stuff that i've got on kind of as much as i possibly can or if i can't if i've already got leggings on for the day and i can't change out of them in time i just whip the trousers on over the top i tend to take merino wool sleeping gear so that adds a bit of extra warmth uh, it's kind of expensive but it really does help with the warmth and I take gloves just in case my hands are going to get cold or in some cases I wear gloves even though it's super hot if it's too sunny because my hands can get sunburned. I take a few pairs of knickers. I want to always ensure that I've got some dry because I don't really want to risk getting a yeast infection from wearing knickers that I've been walking in a sweaty or I've been in the rain and a pair's got wet and you know I don't want to wear that and like risky yeast infection so I, I always ensure that I've got enough to have dry knickers. With sports bras I usually take two different styles so that they're not rubbing in exactly the same place constantly. You don't want the chafing in the same place all the time. I usually take two or three pairs of socks, one to sleep in and two to hike in and rotate them all around. I don't usually tend to take big, thick, thick socks because I've not hiked in snow. And once you get going, your feet swell and they get hot and it can compress in your shoe anyway. I've got some in gingy toe socks, which are really nice because they help splay your toes. It's a really nice feeling actually. And I've got some darn tough socks. I've got kind of spring summer thicknesses of those. Something I took on this hike, which I didn't for some reason take on the Appalachian Trail was a cap. And I loved having a cap. I loved it. I loved it. Take a cap. <laughs> and uh, a buff is great because it can cover your chest if you if it's a really sunny day and you need that or if it's cold and you just need that extra thing around your neck. You can also put it over your hair to like soak up sweat or just to get the hair of your face. My pack doesn't actually have hip pockets on it. So I'm really into the fanny pack bum bag setup and my as made mentioned earlier, snacks for the day from my little pack, then go into my fanny pack and I can eat my snacks out of there as I go along. And also I can dump my bag and just keep the fanny pack on and not have to rummage around in my bag for the snacks and things. I, I much prefer that setup to having hip belt pockets. Some bags just have them built in. You probably could wear both or just stick to the ones that are built in it's no biggie it's just a preference for me and now i'm going to come to some things that i've found to be a hack so just little helpful things as aforementioned number one is probably the ziploc bag scenario 
that I didn't mention in terms of cooking. Rather than cooking, you know, everything in your pot and risking burning things into your pot and having just congealed food all over it, what I will do is, this is a mountain house, for example, put the food into a freezer, Ziploc, boil the water in here, pour the water into my Ziploc, and then I can zip it up, leave it to the side, let it cook itself, go and prepare camp, and come back and then I can eat the food out of this. I've got no washing up to do. And then it just becomes part of my trash or a trash bag and I pop it in there. Also containing Ziplocs. Oh God, I feel so bad with all these Ziplocs and plastic. I'm definitely open to any suggestions from other people, but they're just too handy. Sectioning out toilet roll and some baby wipes or antiseptic, whatever kind of wipes that you want. Rather than taking a whole toilet roll, rather than taking a whole pack of baby wipes, you can just take a little section out and you're saving just, you know, every little bit of weight counts. Speaking of toilet roll, rather than using loads of toilet roll, if you need to pee, I use a pee rag. I know it sounds gross, but it's brilliant get like a microfiber cloth. This is just a flannel, but ignore that. Imagine this is a microfiber cloth. And what you can do to get it cheaper is you can go to like a pound shop or a dollar store and go to the car section and get like a little microfiber flannel. And then what you do is get a hairband, tie it around the corner, and then get a little carabiner and just have that hanging on the outside of your pack and then flipped back on the outside of your pack away from you. I mean, I don't know how much you're peeing, bucket loads of pee you might do. And then it can dry out as you're walking along and it can just be away from you. So that's a great hack. Next one with my puffy jacket. What I do at night is get a dry sack that I'm not using at that moment usually like it's the one that I keep my sleeping bag in so my sleeping bag's out I've got a spare dry sack I stuff my puffy jacket into the dry sack let a little bit of air out so it's not super tall and then I can use that as a pillow I do have a sea to summit pillow that you blow up and I just it's okay but I can't I don't get on with it loads. Obviously this little hack falls down if you need your puffy in an ex extreme circumstance where you need it on whilst you're in bed. But hopefully your sleeping system should be warm enough with your merino and the quilt slash sleeping bag that you have to not have to wear your puffy in bed. If you do have to wear your puffy in bed, you can switch to laying on your clothing dry sack. Okay, bin bag, trash bag heavy duty strong one use this inside of your pack so that you've got double protection on really important items i tend to put this inside of my pack so it's lined and then i will put my sleeping bag my clothes my tent if it's if it's dry so that if it rains it doesn't get wet electronics some things if i need to grab them i'll put them just outside of this and in my bag so I can just reach down I don't have to reach through all the other things and I'll fold the top of this down and then I tend to keep my food on top of that just because that's something that I might need to grab quickly and find something else to scoff <laughs> so it's just that added layer of protection to make sure that all of your very special precious items like clothing and sleeping bags stay away from being wet Ah oh, yes, and I will get a baggie like this and pop my phone into it. And the little silicone packs that you get inside of freeze-dried meals, such as mountain houses or, you know, the ones that say do not eat, as though someone ate them at one point. What I do is I pop that in with my phone so that if there's any humidity flying around, I'm taking my phone out and taking pictures and stuff, then it can go back and the silicone pack can keep it as dry as possible. Now I'm going to go on to where I stayed on the West Thailand Way. I drove 
up to the start in Milgai and then I hiked to Fort William. I got the train back to my car and then I drove home. Just to start with where I parked, there is a police station in Milgai and across the road from the police station there is a bay on the side of that. It's not directly on the side of the road, it's an actual bay cut out of the road and you can park there without having to use a permit and for an indefinite amount of time. I felt very safe with it being there and left it there for the week and it was absolutely fine. You used to be able to park at the train station for free. That's undergoing renovations currently and I don't know if it will still be free when that gets back up and running. So you'll have to double check with that. A couple of people have said if they've stayed in the Premier Inn for the night before in Milgai, that the Premier Inn will keep your car in the car park and they will even take your car key and look after it so that you won't lose it on the trail. They just ask that you put a small donation in the charity box. Again, don't assume these things, just ring ahead and double check if that's okay with them because I'm, I'm not positive as I didn't do that myself, but these are just things that, these are bits of information that I've heard and just to offer you some different options. Right, so this is where I stayed when I hiked on the West Side of Way. Day one, I did 21.2 miles and I stopped at Millerocky Bay campsite. And that was just, well, I say just after, it's quite a descent from Conic Hill, which should not be underestimated, by the way. But I think it was around nine pounds to stay there. Nice facilities, nice people. There's a pub nearby-ish, maybe within a mile. Day two, I stayed on the tip edge of Loch Lomond. I wild camped at mile between 38.6 and 39.3. It's after Dew and Bothy, Bothy. <laughs> you pass the Bothy, which is out on a vista, and you continue for about one or two miles and there's a campsite just on the edge of the lock to your left. Day three, I stayed at By The Way Hostel in Tindrum, Tindrum, which was, why are my pronunciations so bad? Which was at mile 53.4 and it cost around £10.50. Nice place to stay. A bit midgy in the morning for a private campsite but I don't know if you can necessarily help it just I noticed that there were quite a few midges there compared to some of the other campsites. There's nice places to eat like burgers, humongous burgers nearby. At, is it JD's maybe? I had one from there. It was huge. I needed it much appreciated. There's also a shop there called the Green Welly which is all right if not a bit overpriced and a pub. Day four I stopped at a wild camping spot just after the Inveroran Hotel maybe half a mile down the road at you come to a bridge which is at mile 62.9 called Alt -Tol Tolligan. Beautiful but midge infested the next morning. I actually had to unstake my tent, pick my tent up, put it over my head and run down the road with my tent to collapse it. And even then the midges were getting me. Absolutely beautiful, but I think if someone said, would you stay there again? I don't, I don't think I would because the midges were out of control the next day. I couldn't even get my my shoes on. I had to hike in my Crocs for two miles to get away from them all. Day five, I stayed at the Blackwater Hostel in Kinlochleven at mile 81.3. That cost 15 pounds, really nice. Very easy check-in, nice showers washing up facilities, a little bit midgy again, restaurants nearby, yeah, can't, can't fault it. And then day six, I, rather than finish off in Fort William because I just could not stomach the expensive prices of the hotels, which were around about £90 a night, maybe you'll just say, 
screw it i'm going to treat myself but 90 just seemed wildly excessive to me so what i did was stopped a few miles short of fort william at a campsite called glen nevis so that is at mile 93.9 but it is 0.6 miles off the trail but it's at the base of ben nevis and it's got huge views of ben nevis and of course if you want to stop there and then hike ben nevis and then go to fort william the day after like it's a really good place to stop it was 15 pounds to book there as opposed to staying in fort william for 90. i just hiked you know three miles the next day which was a no-brainer to me because then i got in an hour and a half before I was getting the train back to Mill Guys, so I had a nice breakfast, mulled about a little bit, had a look in some shops, and then got on the train and popped home, so that was perfect for me. Yeah, those are the different places that I stayed. I will put all of this information again in the description. Oh, just another tip about where to stay. I was ringing ahead with some places and that they were saying that there was no spots but then I learned quite quickly that they even if you say that you're walking and you want to book for tonight and you're a hiker and you want to book for tonight they will still say that they're full because they book out a certain amount of spots in advance and then they will res you know keep some aside for people that for hikers that just turn up that day i think it's a pretty much you know first come first served walk in couple of spots that they save towards the end of the day so just bear that in mind but um don't be rude about it obviously don't turn up demanding that I'm a walk-in hiker. I watched a YouTube video and she said that you always save spots. Like it is first come first serve. So they may have saved spots, but other people got there before you, or they had less spots that day. It's a different season, rah, 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 many different reasons, but just a little tip that there might be some open, even though if you rang or if you tried to go online and book, it said that there was nothing left. Okay. I think that is mostly everything. If I think of anything else, I will pop it down in the description if I've missed anything. But I think I've gone through everything that I wanted to talk about. Sorry that this video has been quite long. I just wanted to answer as many questions as possible. I know I haven't gone into tents because quite frankly, that's a whole video in itself. If you wanna know what tent I have just for tent sake i have a nemo dragonfly one person tent you want to really steer clear of i don't know some a lot lots of people have bangos and i think you know for what they are and for the price that they are they're they're fine but they're heavy and if hiking something that you want to get into the, the trouble is you might not know that until after you've done this you don't want to you know splash out like crazy and uh realize that you don't really want to do it and then you've splashed out but a lot of good gear does hold its value unlike a lot of other things nowadays people tend to buy hiking gear at roundabout similar value to what you purchased it at bearing in mind it's in it's in a fairly reason it's in a reasonable slash good condition other brands to look at are big agnes msr maybe but they can be a little bit on the heavier side van gogh's are really really budget level pretty hefty hefty uh, old tents so if this is completely a one-off and you're on a budget 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 then you know go go for it and again i haven't gone into packs because that's another minefield uh, i have a z packs but that's an american brand and they make them from scratch they take six weeks to make you're gonna have to pay custom fees i happened to get one when i was over in america i mean if you want to get one and you want to pay all that that's great so z packs just so you know loads of people go for ospreys i've had an osprey aura 50 liter before a fantastic pack in ways but very very heavy in other ways i actually have done a review 
a bit of an angry review on trail in my previous videos if you want to have a look at that again i'll link all this stuff yes lots of things to say if i've missed anything let me know if you want to clarify something please ask me if you want to ask me about any equipment that i haven't mentioned please ask me and i'll answer in the comment section but yeah that's just a bit of a guide to things to take on the west highland way and i thoroughly enjoyed myself i would definitely go again it would have been great if i'd started off doing that hike before i went on the at because I was really thrown into it on the 80. <laughs> okay, well, thanks for watching, and I hope to do another hike soon. If I think of any other topics to do videos on, then I will go right ahead and make more videos, but for now, I am over and out.